Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the Jewish Democratic Council of America's Arizona First Congressional District's Democratic Issues Forum, JDCA's fifth candidate forum of the 2024 election cycle. I'm Deborah Stein, JDCA board member and outreach chair, as well as the Arizona chapter lead. JDCA is the political home and voice of Jewish Democrats, advocating for policies and electing Democratic candidates who share our core values. Since the 2020 election, we've held issue forums such as this one in Democratic primaries to provide opportunities for candidates to speak to issues of importance to Jewish voters. We're grateful to those of you who have joined us today and hope you find this forum informative. Most importantly, we hope you vote. This is a historic moment when our freedom, rights, and democracy are at stake. On the issues and countless others, Democrats are a crucial line of defense to protect our values. This is why JDCA is working to ensure President Biden is reelected and Democrats win back the House majority in November. Arizona's first congressional district is one of many that Democrats can and must flip from red to blue. Arizona's first congressional district is also home for Arizona's largest Jewish constituent, constituency. We're thrilled to be joined by three candidates today, Andre Cherney, Connor O'Callaghan, and Kurt Cromer. JDCA CEO Haley Soifer will moderate our conversation. Thank you all again for being here and for your patience while we got started. And I'll pass it over to Haley, who will explain the forum rules and to begin. Haley, over to you. Thank you, Deborah. I'm Haley Soifer, CEO of JDCA, and I wanna welcome our three candidates and those viewers watching today for our issues forum in Arizona's first district Democratic primary. As the political home and voice of Jewish voters advocating for policies and supporting Democrats who share our values, JDCA is mobilizing millions of voters across the country and helping to make helping them make informed decisions at the ballot box with issue forums like this one. Before we begin, I will go over the rules which have been shared in advance with the candidates. First, this is an issues forum and not a debate. Candidates will answer the questions by addressing the audience and they won't engage with, address, or refer directly to one another. Second, there will be no rebuttals. If this rule is violated, candidates will receive one warning. After that, we will mute candidates for violating the rule. Third, this is not a campaign event. Candidates will not ask for your vote or financial support. They'll share their views on a range of issues of importance to Jewish and Democratic voters. Fourth, there will be time limits. Candidates will have two minutes for introductory remarks followed by questions, which they will then have one minute to answer each. We will rotate the order for responses, and at the end of the forum, candidates will have the opportunity to make 90-second closing statements. As a reminder, we kindly ask the candidates to adhere to time limits and the rules. We'll keep time throughout the forum with a Zoom timer, which the candidates can see. When time has expired, a bell will ring, which sounds like this. Thank you. Now that we've reviewed the rules, we're ready to begin the forum with opening statements. With their permission, we will address the candidates by their first name and proceed in alphabetical order of first names and then rotate. So we will start with Andre, followed by Kurt, sorry, followed by Connor, and then Kurt. Over to you, Andre, for your two minute opening statement. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to uh, JDCA for uh organizing this and for everything that uh, this organization does uh, which is so critical especially in a time like this i'll just briefly tell you uh, my story uh, and it really is why i'm running for congress um, all four of my grandparents were concentration camp survivors and my parents were born right after the war in uh behind the eastern uh behind the iron curtain in eastern europe and uh, in czechoslovakia and they were born into a free Western style democracy and then watched that democracy fall. Uh, my mother's earliest memory is of visiting her father in jail. And uh, the official crime was capitalist, but when we got his uh, Secret Service dossier a few years ago, uh, written on the front of it was uh, the word Zionista. Uh, he was put in jail after having gotten out of Auschwitz, put in jail for being Jewish. Uh, 
to me, to my family, democracy isn't abstract. Uh, it's, it's real. And I'm in this race because having experienced the joys of democracy, I've also seen in my own family the cost of losing democracy and losing freedom. And my grandparents didn't survive everything that they survived. My parents didn't uh, endure what they endured uh, for me to stand by as our democracy teeters on the edge in this election, as basic freedoms are, are being taken away from us. Uh, my wife and daughter's freedom to um, be able to choose what they do with their body. Uh, my uh, kids' freedom to read the books that they want to read in their library. My brother who's gay has a uh, uh, freedom to uh, hopefully uh, one day get married and settle down with a nice Jewish boy. Uh, all of these are up for grabs in this election. Uh, I'm excited to tell you more about my background and uh, my work over the years, uh, whether it was working in the White House for President Clinton uh, or uh, all of the other work I've done to fight for these values uh, throughout uh, my career. Thank you. We'll now hear from Connor. Hi, everybody. Great to be here with you all. And, and thanks to JDCA for setting this up. It's a, a great opportunity to meet with all of you and, and talk about us and our and our shared values. So my name is Connor O'Callaghan. I'm running for Congress in Arizona's first congressional district, the very same district where I grew up. I was born in Ireland. I moved to what is now CD1 when I was four years old. I still had an Irish accent. I had an Irish accent until first grade when my teacher thought that I had a speech impediment called my parents in for an emergency parent-teacher conference because she was worried about me. And then she heard my parents speak and thought, oh my goodness, all three of them have speech impediments. Uh, but in, in all seriousness, it was my Irish accent. The diagnosis uh, was that they were going to teach me proper American. And I've spoken like this ever since I was in the first grade. But growing up here in CD1, things were better. So 30 years ago, women had the right to have an abortion. We had an assault weapons ban and fighting climate change was cool. I'm sure everybody remembers reduce, reuse, recycle. So thanks to people like David Schweikert, we have gone backwards, despite the great strides that we've made as, as a country and as a society over the last 30 years, individual freedoms are under attack. And if you're a woman, if you're a minority, if you're part of the LGBTQ community, if, if you're Jewish, your rights have been infringed upon and rolled back and you live in very unsafe, uncertain times. That is why I am running for Congress. My wife, Tina, was born in Iran, and when she was two years old, she had to flee that country with her family because of the extremist regime that came in and took over, the same extremist regime threatening to push us into World War III today. My grandfather was a United Nations general, served for three decades across three continents, and was a peacekeeper in the Middle East, including keeping peace between Israelis and Palestinians. These fights have been going on for decades. We need to move forwards, not backwards. That is why I am running. We have to make a positive change, and I hope that all of you will join me. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Kurt. Reminder to unmute. Yep. Got it. So, uh, look, I, I believe that in this important race, this very important race, that experience and qualifications matter. And so let me just speak for that for a couple of minutes. Uh, first off, I worked for the US Congress already for 10 years and had a top secret clearance and did national security investigations, including whether Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons in the Persian Gulf War. I have a master's degree in international affairs with concentrations in international law and national security. So I don't come to any of this uh, yesterday. I don't Google Israel Hamas or divestiture for two hours and then think that I'm some kind of expert. I also was the chief operating officer of an organization called Humanity United. And we worked to end genocides and mass atrocities around the world. I have spent time in the Congo meeting with a war criminal. Uh, trying to understand what it would take for his rebel troops to put down their arms as they were committing atrocities all along the eastern part of the Congo. Also, when you think about gun violence, the tree of life, right, the synagogue, that was almost six years ago. Time has passed quickly. But I led the Red Cross response to the mass shooting in El Paso. I have experienced the 
the horrible effects of mass shootings. And right, we see this almost daily, uh, these attacks against minority groups and others. And so I, I understand this. I've worked it my whole entire life. It is my passion. And that's why I'm gonna go to Congress to make sure that we've got folks there that stand up for democracy, stand up for uh, liberties, and stop all of this chaos. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. We will now move into questions on a range of important issues for Jewish voters, starting with climate change. So our first question, amid an increasingly urgent climate crisis, it is critical for Congress to take action to reduce greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions and support sustainable infrastructure. This is also a local issue in your district as Arizona has been hit hard by wildfires, droughts, and deadly heat waves. Last year, Phoenix experienced the hottest summer ever on record with 54 days of the temperature reaching or exceeding 110 degrees. If elected, what steps would you take to mitigate the devastating consequences of climate change? We will start with Connor and then Kurt and Andre. Connor. Well, fantastic question. And, and clearly climate change is front and center here in Arizona. You know, different places experience it differently. Uh, as you mentioned with all those stats, we're uh, we're on the forefront of it, as is Israel to a large extent. So I think there's a few different things that need to happen at the federal level. First of all, FEMA spends tens of billions of dollars each year on responding to natural disasters like hurricanes and tornadoes. Now, thankfully, we don't have those issues here in Arizona, but consequently, that's a source of federal funding that we don't really participate in. So something that needs to happen in Congress and something that I will push for is to make sure that heat and water-related emergencies are treated the same way as things like hurricanes and tornadoes, because that federal funding, those billions of dollars that, that Arizona can get a piece of, would go a long way towards climate change mitigation and working to secure our water future. So on that note, I, I think, you know, when I think of climate change here in Arizona, I think first and foremost of water, because we can have the best district in the country, and I think that we do. Um, we can, oh, that was short. <laughs> yes, as a reminder, there's one minute to answer each question. Uh, we'll now turn to Kurt. Well, again, getting back to qualifications and experience. So I was a senior executive at the national headquarters of the Red Cross. I was the CEO of the American Red Cross for Arizona, New Mexico, and El Paso. So I led the American Red Cross response to the largest wildfire in New Mexico history. That was about three years ago. When Hurricane Harvey was about to hit Houston, I flew in the day before the hurricane hit. And I led the Texas Gulf Coast region, the CEO of the Red Cross put me in charge of that uh, because they knew I could uh, solve the problems that were gonna happen in Houston. So I know this firsthand. In terms of uh, how we fix these things, look, we have to stop drilling on federal lands. We've gotta provide more subsidies to get uh, you know, solar and clean energy. And we've gotta just stop all this fossil fuel, right? I, at the end of the day, this is an existential threat to this, to the world. And there are several, programs that Biden has put in place that are good first steps. And we just need to continue to uh, move forward on the clean energy and get rid of the fossil fuel dependency we have. Thank you, Andre. I'm glad you're starting on this issue because while our democracy is on the line in this election, so is the future of our planet. Uh, this is the issue I've spent more of my time during my career on than anything else. Uh, started my career working for then Vice President Al Gore in the White House on the issue we were calling back then global warming and have continued working on that. I spent the past 10 years building a company that helped people and businesses move their money so that it was no longer being used to fund uh, climate change creating activities. Uh, we helped millions of people move billions of dollars out of fossil fuels, created the world's largest, one of the world's largest private sector reforestation efforts. Um, that uh, planted over 100 million trees. Arizona is ground zero for the problem, as you said, but Arizona can also be and should be ground zero for the solution. Arizona should be the solar state. We should be the clean energy capital of the world. We should be the clean energy jobs. What Detroit is to cars or Silicon Valley is to computers. That's gonna take federal leadership and it's gonna take a member of Congress who's really dedicated to making that happen. Thank you. We'll now turn to the economy. 
Since taking office, President Biden has taken historic action to rebuild the middle class and support working families, including by expanding the child tax credit, empowering union workers, and investing in small businesses. Thanks to the Biden administration, unemployment is at a 50-year low, and Arizona received huge investments in infrastructure and manufacturing. If elected to Congress, what measures would you take to continue the economic progress made by the Biden administration in Arizona? We'll start with Kurt, followed by Andre and Connor. And as a reminder, one minute each for your answers. Kurt. Well, look, there are a number of federal programs that would help us uh, move folks from the middle up and frankly, from the bottom up. And President Biden has started that. As you guys know, uh, the child earned income tax credit was expanded during the pandemic. We virtually got rid of childhood poverty and now it's gone away. So I would work uh, vociferously to uh, bring back the, an expanded child earned income tax credit, right? Pre-K education, subsidies for child care, more subsidies for health care uh, through the Affordable Care Act and other health care programs. Look, this is not only family friendly, it's economy friendly. And we can pay for this. Trump's tax cuts, $3 trillion. That cost us $3 trillion. We could pay for a much stronger social safety net uh, outlined some of the things that I just outlined that would help help folks so that they can continue to prosper in this country. And that's what we want everybody to do, right? And right now it's the rich that are prospering and not most of the rest of America. Great, Andre. Uh I'm glad that uh, Kurt and, and and Haley, you mentioned the expanded or uh, expanded child tax credit because that is so critical. Uh, look, part of this is about making sure that we as a country have our priorities straight. Uh, again, I mentioned I had worked in the Clinton White House, and back then we balanced the budget uh, and had a budget surplus at the same time that we had record economic growth, invested in our people with the child uh, health program. Uh, expanded college access, the biggest amount since the GI Bill after World War II. Uh, what the Republican Congress did over the years of the Trump administration was the most fiscally irresponsible steps of cutting taxes for big corporations and billionaires while raising taxes for everyday people. We need to do the reverse. We need to invest in the economy of the future. Here in Arizona, that's things like the CHIPS Act that is already creating jobs. One third of all union carpenters in Arizona are working on these big uh, semiconductor factories. We need to do the same thing, investing in the economy of the future, investing in skills and investing in schools, because that's how we're going to power our economic growth. Connor. So the economy under President Biden has sort of been the tale of two cities. If you look at traditional economic metrics, stock markets are at near all time highs, unemployment's at near record lows, unemployment for minorities is at historic lows. So it feels like the economy is doing great but people are still feeling squeezed at their kitchen table. And that's a result of the inflation that came out of COVID. You know, with the Inflation Reduction Act and other measures, President Biden and his administration have done a great job in bringing that down, but we need to continue to be vigilant in this space. We need to combat price gouging because corporations are still making record profits. They haven't brought their prices down commensurate with the bottlenecks being relieved that, you know, backed up during COVID. So that's an important component of it. The next part is we have to revamp our tax code. Our tax code currently advantages billionaires at the expense of the middle class and advantages large corporations at the expense of small businesses. We need to flip that because that's what's going to keep the economic engine of this country really humming. Thank you. We'll now move to immigration. This is a top issue for voters this cycle, particularly in border states like Arizona, where approximately one in eight residents is an immigrant. Earlier this year, a group of Republicans at the behest of Donald Trump killed a bipartisan immigration reform bill, which would have transformed immigration policy and enhanced security at our border. Despite Republicans' failure to create this change, President Biden has taken action to secure the border, expanding pathways to citizenship, and defending DACA recipients. What immigration reform measures would you like to see implemented by Congress if elected? We'll start with Andre, followed by Kurt, sorry, Connor, and then Kurt. Andre. Incredibly important issue to people here in Arizona and, and nationally. Uh, it's something that I know personally. Uh, as Arizona Assistant Attorney General, I was a border prosecutor. Uh, I prosecuted one of the largest border smuggling rings 
ever in Arizona history, these large organizations bringing not just people, but drugs and guns across our border. And so we need to, number one, uh, get control of the border. We're already starting to see that what President Biden has been doing, early signs that it's uh, on its way to working. But we need to have more Border Patrol agents. We need to streamline our asylum system and make it actually work for people. We also have to recognize recognize the humanity of, of people. Uh, I say this as the son of immigrants, as the son of people who came here as refugees, welcomed with open arms. Uh, we need an immigration system that works. That's not just about the border, but it's embracing people from all over the world who want to come and make America their home in the way that all of our families have over generations. Honor. All right. So as I mentioned in my intro, my wife and I are both immigrants. So immigration clearly is very important to me and my family. The reality is this. People like immigration. They don't like chaos and disorder. And that's what we've had at the border, frankly, for decades at this point. And as mentioned, you know, the Republicans are the ones that consistently kill any efforts for reform. We need to do four primary things. We need to work on economic development in countries like Venezuela, make sure that people there have opportunity so that they stay and don't want to have to flee to come to America. We need to work with our counterparts in Mexico to better patrol the southern border of Mexico, which is much narrower than the U.S.-Mexico border. We need to use the technology that we have, drones, satellites, et cetera, to have a secure virtual border. We don't need to build a border wall. And we need to revamp our immigration court and judge system. Instead of it taking four to six years to have an asylum claim, we should be able to process these in real time at the border, certainly in 75% of cases. That in and of itself will ease the flow and, uh, and, and, and help solve this problem once and for all. Kurt. So again, I'm going to keep getting back to this. Uh, experience and qualifications matter. So I, as the CEO of the American Red Cross for Arizona, New Mexico, and El Paso for the past six and a half years, I worked along the border. I was heady, helping to sell, set up shelters with the Red Cross and other nonprofits. I worked with the Customs and Border Patrol to try to make sure that they were handling uh, migrants uh, humanely so that we could work with them more closely. And look, at the end of the day, this is what we got to do. Uh, one, we have to provide more technology along the border. We have that available. The Republicans don't want to pay for it. We need more immigration courts and more immigration judges, but we need to make sure that kids and families have the proper, uh, uh, they have the lawyers available to them so that they have a chance to get through their case properly. We need to actually uh, speed up the process for green card applicants. We have hundreds of people waiting for to come into this country with green cards and the system isn't set up to do that because we don't have enough money so sometimes money actually matters and we can fix this problem thank you we'll now move on to anti-semitism anti-semitism is on the rise in the united states and around the world since donald trump's election in 2016 jewish communities including many in arizona have experienced an increase in anti-semitic attacks and republicans have emboldened right-wing extremists who spew anti-semitic rhetoric david schweikert is no exception he's compared unions to nazi officials and endorsed candidates who embrace anti-semitic conspiracy theories while donald trump has targeted the vast majority of american jews with anti-semitic rhetoric and refused to condemn white supremacy, President Biden has been a strong ally of the Jewish community and has unveiled the first ever national strategy to counter anti-Semitism. What would you do to combat anti-Semitism in Arizona and nationally if elected to Congress? We'll start with Connor, followed by Kurt and Andre. Connor. So, so clearly anti-Semitism has no place in our society, and a lot of what we've seen happening on our college campuses and elsewhere, including the recent demonstration in, in Lower Manhattan, which was a tribute to the victims of, of October 7th, we, we have to combat it in no uncertain terms. You know, we have the First Amendment here. There's a right to free speech. There's not a right for racial hate, and anti-Semitism absolutely has to be stopped in no uncertain terms. And, and we have to do it because Jewish people do not feel safe in their own communities. And I hear this most prominently from my friends in New York, in New York City and in Westchester County, who actually in many cases feel like they're leaving the Democratic Party or that the Democratic Party has left them because some of the rhetoric that we hear from the far left of our own party. 
And, and so that's the reason why you're starting to see more Jewish voters move to the right, more Jewish voters back Donald Trump. We need to combat anti-Semitism because we cannot have that. The margins here in Arizona are so thin. Schweiker won by 3,000 3, votes. We have to stay unified and stamp out anti-Semitism. Kurt. So, right, we just saw the Supreme Court amazingly <laughs> uh, allow the federal government to reach out to social media platforms and try to move along uh, efforts to stop hate speech uh, on their platforms. If you think about it, a lot of this, everything that we're seeing, a lot of this happens online and then people get sped up and then they start to take uh, violent action because of that. So one of the pieces of legislation I would want to work on is to make sure that these social media platforms actually have a responsibility and are held accountable for making sure that hate speech uh, isn't available. There's a fine line between free speech and hate speech, and it's being crossed on these social media platforms. So that is absolutely one place. And then secondly, right? I mean, when, when we, we have to fight back, when Trump starts to use these kinds of words and the whole G, uh, Republican Party does that, uh, sure, we jump up and we say this is all wrong. But at the end of the day, we have to stand up for what's right and make sure people understand that's the Democratic Party. Andre. Yeah, I 100% agree with uh, what my uh, two colleagues here said as well. Look, to me, this is personal, as you might imagine. Uh, I, when I had my uh, bar mitzvah uh, many years ago, uh, I told the story about my mother picking me up from Hebrew school, and uh, we were walking down the street. We, we didn't have a car, and she told me, uh, just given where she had come from in her life, to take my kippah off my head because I shouldn't be wearing that out uh, on a public street. And I you know, looked at her uh, as maybe only a 12 or 13 year old can do who knows everything and said, oh, in America, we don't have to worry about those kinds of things. Well, it was my daughter's bat mitzvah uh, at the end of last year. And uh, we had family coming from and friends coming from all over the country. We we're going to have a taco truck uh, in the parking lot uh, of our shul. And we were told we couldn't do that uh, because uh, we had to move it indoors for safety reasons. We have to police uh, these words, whether they're coming from Donald Trump or whether they're coming on college campuses and coming from uh, the left, even members of our party, uh, like what we saw with Jamal Bowman, uh, because uh, anti-Semitism is a canary in the coal mine and it has to be stopped because hate builds on itself and affects everybody. We are going to move on now to democracy. The future of democracy was the number one issue for Jewish voters in the 2022 midterms and will likely be again in November. Right now, we are seeing unprecedented attacks on our democracy with Republicans spewing election conspiracy theories and stripping Americans of voting rights as Donald Trump refuses to commit to accepting election results should he lose the upcoming presidential election. In Arizona, Republicans who lost in 2022 continue to lie about the election results. And just last week, the Arizona Court of Appeals dismissed a right-wing attempt to overturn the 2022 election. What do you believe are the most important measures Congress could take to protect our democracy? We will start with Kurt, followed by Andre and Connor. Kurt. Well, this is fundamentally why I joined this race, was to protect our democracy. When I worked in Africa, I saw how democracy dies. I worked in uh, Cuba, and I know how democracy, uh, if you don't have it, it doesn't work. And so, look, first thing we need to do is make sure that people have the right to vote, right? There are several pieces of legislation out there, the John Lewis Act, Protect Voting Rights Act, that just make it easier for people to vote. And what the Republicans are trying to do is they're trying to take that right away because they know they can't win if enough people vote. They know this. So that's one piece. The second piece is around making sure that we have an independent judiciary. And right now, what I'm seeing across this country, we don't. Time and time again, they put cases in front of uh, GOP-friendly judges, and then they start to have a nationwide injunction, and rights are taken away for all sorts of different communities and people. And so, look, we, we got to get back to where we have the rule of law, an independent judiciary, an independent frat press, and, and make sure that people are held accountable for that. Andre, I'll, I'll agree with everything that uh, that Kurt said, and and go on from there. Which is, we also need to make sure that our democracy is working, and that we have a democracy that people are are willing to fight for. Uh, so many people around the country have given up 
on our democracy. They see their standard of living not having increased year after year. And when people don't have hope, they become an easy mark for an agenda of hate. Uh, we've all seen this before throughout history, unfortunately. And somebody like Donald Trump who comes along and doesn't have any answers but points a finger of division and anger. Uh, so many young people have given up on democracy. They've grown up over the past 25, 30 years uh, where 80% of Americans want a assault weapons ban. 80% uh, of Americans want comprehensive immigration reform, action on climate change, and year after year, it doesn't happen. So we need to do things not only around voting, but making sure that we change our campaign finance laws, that we expand the ways in which people's voices can come into the deliberations in the Capitol, in our Congress, in the United States, so that our democracy actually is responsive and answering to people. Connor. I think first and foremost, we have to stop electing people that are election deniers and insurrectionists. I mean, imagine for a moment that Kerry Lake had won or Abe Hamaday had won the last time around. You know, think about people that are very unpopular in this room, like Mike Pence and Doug Ducey. If they hadn't done the right thing in our time of need as a state and as a country, we could be in a very different spot. The Republicans have have realized that the only way they can win and sustainably win over the long haul as as MAGA is by making sure that people can't vote. So we have to pass things like the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And there's something very important in there called preclearance. And that requires places largely in the South that have a history of racial discrimination. They have to get federal approval before they change their election laws. We need more checks and balances like that in the system, and we need to better fund our elections officials to make sure that everything can be run with integrity and transparency, because we have a great 250-year-old democracy, and I want to see it continue for another 250 years. Thank you. We'll now move on to ethics. After a long-standing House, House Ethics Committee investigation, Representative David Schweikert admitted to 11 ethics violations, including misuse of campaign funds for personal reasons. Along with Representative Schweikert, many congressional members have been subjects of recent ethics investigations, including Representative Gates and former Representative Santos. More broadly, trust in Congress is at an all-time low, and concerns about fraud, corruption, and control by special interests in Citizens United have eroded public faith in government. If elected, what efforts would you support to restore trust in Congress? We'll start with Andre, followed by Connor and Kurt. Andre. Uh, you know, uh, as much as we will criticize David Schweikert, it has to be admitted he has a bipartisan achievement. He's one of five people in all of American history to be unanimously censured by both parties. That takes a lot for everybody to uh, agree on. But in all seriousness, uh, we have to start restoring faith in, in Congress, restoring faith in our, uh, in our democracy uh, and in uh, the way that uh, our government works. And, and part of that is ethics. Uh, it's in Congress, but let's also admit it's in the Supreme Court. Uh, and I say this as somebody who's watched the Supreme Court going back to the year 2000 when they un interfered with the uh, election uh, in, in that race to everything they've done since. We need an ethics code that applies to all aspects of our government. And we need a uh, belief that the rule of law covers everybody, whether you're selling drugs on a street corner, whether you're on a college campus protesting, whether you're in the corner office, or whether you're the former president in the Oval Office. In all three branches of our government, we need to make sure that the rule of law is there, even if you're in elective office. Connor. Well, the question mentioned Citizens United and, and the influence of money and dark money in politics. And I'm, I'm proud to say that I've signed American Promise and, and have that organization's support as an American Promise candidate. That means that I've pledged in Congress to do whatever I can to end Citizens United and get dark money out of politics. You know, money is something that unfortunately in this environment is very necessary in politics. It's very hard to win without money. Uh, it doesn't need to be that way. It certainly doesn't need to be that way from a dark money perspective. And the fact that corporations and individuals can put in unlimited amounts of money that's essentially unreported, you know, it's problematic and it's something that that needs to be addressed once and for all at the federal level. You know, as Andre alluded to, the, the courts don't really have our back on this. So it's something we're going to have to do legislatively, clearly. As it pertains to Schweikert's ethics violations, I, you know, I think that's been covered. Um, the thing is, voters don't really seem to care. They are so jaded by all of these ethics violations that it doesn't stick. 
So how we're going to beat him in November is by shining a bright light on his absolutely heinous voting record. Thanks. So I remember when I worked for Congress for 10 years and I would go out on some investigation, I, I couldn't accept a coffee. Literally, I couldn't accept a coffee. I had to pay for it myself. Uh, that's how it's supposed to be. And right now, we just saw the Supreme Court yesterday. They uh, granted uh, the ability of public officials to take gratuities uh, from uh, companies. And then in this particular case, somebody was able to get a company to get a big, huge contract, uh, the mayor. And then, you know, two weeks later, he gets a $13,000 gratuity from this company. I mean, this is outrageous. And the Supreme Court al allowed this to happen. So look, we, we've got to make sure that it, that Frankly, we, we've got to expand the Supreme Court. I, I wasn't in favor of that, and I am now. And this is the only way we get into the, into a space where, where ethics is valued again. And again, I agree with my colleagues. Outrageous that the Supreme Court just monitors itself. You know, that, that ain't working. We've, we've seen that. Thank you. I would now like to invite one of our Arizona chapter members and volunteers, Jacob Marson, to ask our next question on the youth vote. Jacob. Thank you, Haley. The youth vote is a critical constituency that helped President Biden win the 2020 election and will be key this year for Democrats, including in Arizona's first congressional district. In your conversations with young voters, what issue priorities have you heard? If elected to Congress, how will you address the concerns of young voters? We will start with on Connor. We will start with Connor, then Kurt, then Andre. Well, Jacob, great to see you, and thanks for all the hard work that you and Keep Arizona Blue Student Coalition are doing. It's it's really tremendous stuff, and, and great to see. So the youth vote is absolutely critical. You know, we're talking about you know a seat that David Schweiker won by three thousand votes, and we're talking about a state that Joe Biden won by ten thousand votes. And the research overwhelmingly shows that the youth vote breaks in our direction. So we need to get people engaged. We need to get them out to vote. A lot of younger folks are registering as independents because they don't love this, you know, sort of fractured party system that we have. But the universal issue that that I keep hearing from young voters is is really affordability and the future of the economy. You know, so if you look at rent, if you look at you know buying a house if you're a young person, and if you look at the the job market and ability to just live, you know, on a on a you know entry level job that you get out of school or that you have while you're in college. It's very, very hard to do. So we need to make sure that the economy works for everybody. And we as Democrats need to be the ones that are creating jobs, making sure people are paid livable wages. That's what matters to our young people. Kurt. Hi, Jacob. Uh, good to see you again. So, you know, Connor's actually right. Uh, I, I have now knocked on 15,000 doors personally. And it's not just a 65-year-old that answers the door. And what I've heard over and over and over again from uh, young folks that answer the door or they're at the meetings that I'm at, it is affordability. And it's affordability around education. It's affordability around housing. It's affordability around health care. You just think about every single aspect of their life is unaffordable to them. And they can't see a pathway forward. I have a 23-year-old son, and the other day he said to me, Dad, like, I don't know how I'm ever going to buy a house. And these, you know, this is, I never had to worry. I, I, I knew for a fact at some point I'd be able to buy a house, and that's not the case anymore. And what we need to do with the youth vote is to remind them what it was like under Trump and what it will be like under Trump. So maybe you're not so super happy about uh, President Biden. You know, you've got an autocratic uh, crazy man. So that that's your choice, uh, autocrat or somebody that's getting things done. And Andre. Uh, Jacob, a second uh, what everybody else said about. I was worried. Okay, the oh, Andre, sorry. we lost you for a minute. Sorry. We're gonna, we're gonna, that's okay. We'll start the clock again for you. What, one moment. Apologies. Um, um, okay. Yeah, Jacob, thank, thank you for everything that you and your group are, are doing. I absolutely agree on affordability, uh, but uh, we'll just expand it uh, from, from there as well with uh, really some of the critical issues that young people especially don't understand why our politics is failing to address. Things like the climate crisis, 
uh, where people, especially young people, know that we need dramatic change. Uh, things like gun safety legislation. I'm really um, honored uh, to have the support of the League of Conservation Voters uh, in this race. I'm honored to have the support of the Brady Pack against gun violence, because these are the kinds of issues where we need to make progress, where we need to be able to drive change uh, and, and be able to respond to the young people who look at our politics, look at our democracy and feel that it's just not working for them and plainly not even working, period. Thank you. All right, I can't, great, my, I must mute. All right, um, thank you both all. We'll now turn to Israel. It has been more than eight months since Hamas brutally attacked Israel on October 7th. More than 100 people are still in captivity, including at least five Americans. President Biden has stood strongly by Israel in, its, in his defense, uh, in its defense against Hamas, advocated for increased humanitarian aid into Gaza, and worked to negotiate a deal that secures the release of all the hostages. What is your position on President Biden's handling of the conflict since October 7th? We'll start with Kurt, followed by Andre and Connor. Kurt. So one minute to answer this uh, complicated question. I was waiting for this. Uh, look, I actually think given the situation that that is at hand, President Biden has done a very commendable job, right? He has this three-point plan that, that I support. Uh, he has worked closely with our allies to make sure that uh, we, we continue to support Israel as best that we can. And let's just remember, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if Hamas had not gone in and killed over a thousand Israeli citizens, right? This wouldn't even be happening. And so it's not only Hamas. It's the Houthis, it's Hezbollah, it's Hezbollah K, it's Iran, and we have to stand firmly beside Israel because it's, it is it is a larger global conflict. And these are entities that want the destruction of Israel. And so as Americans, we have to stand steadfast with them. And I believe that uh, President Biden has done a, a commendable job in an otherwise almost impossible situation. Andre. I, I agree. I think uh, President Biden has done a masterful uh, job. Um, this is a critical test, not just of what's going on in Israel and in Gaza, but really of the kind of century uh, that we're going to live in. And uh, whatever one thinks about uh, the response to October 7th, uh, this is a situation where Israel has not just a right, but a duty to defend itself. I believe, and I still believe, that the ultimate solution has to be a two-state solution. It's unfortunate that we have seen that support for the two-state solution has atrophied, both on uh, the, let's say, the left, uh, for those who believe that that is no longer the case, and, and for those on the right. But we need to be thinking about how do we build a future where you have two nations living side by side in peace, prosperity, security for all. And that's not going to happen with Hamas in power. And so as terrible as the situation is, we have to drive towards a better solution. So I was a friend of Israel's on October 6th, and I'm still a friend of Israel's today. Israel absolutely has every right to defend itself, and it must defend its democracy. My grandfather spent decades of his life keeping peace in the region, and we must push towards lasting peace. There is one obstacle in the short term towards that lasting peace, and that is Hamas. We have to flip the narrative, particularly in this country. You know, President Biden has done a great job working with Qatar, working with Egypt, you know, obviously working with Israel. There is a deal on the table that would have a ceasefire and a full release of the hostages. There's only one counterparty that won't sign off on that deal, and that is Hamas. There was a ceasefire on October 6th, and there could be a ceasefire now. There is never going to be, nor should there be, a ceasefire while there are still hostages. So every single ounce of international diplomacy and every single ounce of U.S. efforts should push towards a ceasefire that's contingent upon the full release of hostages. That's what President Biden has done. We need Hamas to come to the table and agree. 
Thank you. We have another question on Israel. Congress and the Democratic Party have consistently reaffirmed their commitment to Israel's security. This has been demonstrated by the 10-year U.S.-Israel Memorandum of Understanding that was signed by the Obama-Biden administration in 2016, which provided $38 billion in military assistance and life-saving missile defense programs. Democrats also overwhelmingly supported supplemental military assistance sent to Israel after October 7th, while Republicans delayed that vital aid for six months. Do you support U.S. military assistance to Israel pursuant to the 2016 MOU? And do you support and or do you support any cuts, conditions or restrictions on this aid? We will start with Andre, followed by Connor and Kurt. I absolutely support uh, continued uh, aid to Israel um, and, and actually spoke out uh, when uh, the Biden administration was holding back some of uh, the um, weapons uh, needed. Uh, this is not a time to be uh, to be pulling back on support for Israel. It's a time to be doubling down. Uh, this is a fight for the future of democracy. It is a fight for uh, our close ally. Uh, it is a fight for the nature of uh, a nation that needs to be able to defend itself because in defending itself, it is defending the values that all of us believe in. Jewish or non-Jewish as Democrats, uh, that is what this fight is about. Uh, and we have to be standing with Israel. We have to be uh, making sure that Israel has the support that it needs to prosecute this war uh, to its ultimate conclusion. Connor. So short answer, yes. I, I support the MOU and I support continued aid to Israel with no strings attached. Israel's our friend, Israel's our ally. You trust your friends and you have your friends back and we need to have Israel's back now more than ever. Obviously matters directly for Israel, but as others have alluded to, you know, this is even broader than Israel. Iran is clearly watching what's happening with Israel, but Russia's obviously watching what we do with Ukraine and China's watching because they're wondering what they're gonna do with Taiwan. We need to defend democracy everywhere. We need to have our friends' backs this is not a time to hold back or put conditions. You know, clearly we have an opinion, we have a voice and, and, and we can make our opinions known, but Israel is democracy. It needs to fight its own battles, which it's doing valiantly, and it shouldn't have strings attached from its friends. Kurt. So I do support the MOU. Uh, you know, let's let's look at where some of this goes to. A lot of this is defensive weaponry, right? Around Iron Dome and uh, David Sling and the Arrow. This is just to stop incoming ballistic missiles from coming into uh, the citizenry of of Israel. And so they obviously Israel has a right to defend itself, and we should help them do that. And even on the offensive side, again, this is not just Hamas. Right? A lot of these weapons that are being thrown over from the Houthis and all are coming from Iran and other uh, terrorist organizations. And so we have a, a, a responsibility to help Israel in this case. And secondly, you know, if you look back at why that was delayed, that, that funding, you know, the, the Republican Party didn't want to support our allies in Ukraine. Th this is outrageous. We have a murderous dictator in Russia. And now we're holding back and hundreds of Ukrainians lost their lives because of that delay. I'm a strong proponent of also supporting Ukraine. Thank you. We'll now turn to abortion. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned in 2022, abortion rights have been under attack across the country, including in Arizona, where the state Supreme Court recently reinstated a Civil War era abortion ban. Democratic lawmakers were instrumental in protecting Arizonans' reproductive freedoms by quickly repealing the law, and Jewish groups worked to sue the state, arguing that abortion bans are an infringement of our religious freedom. Nearly nine in 10 Jewish voters believe abortion should be legal in all or some cases. What measures would you take to ensure reproductive care remains accessible to all? We'll start with Connor, followed by Kurt and Andre. All right, a lot to hit in one minute. So we have the abortion access amendment on the ballot here in November in Arizona 
that needs to get passed. We need to enshrine and protect abortion rights at the state level. But we need to do it federally. I, I don't actually like the term restore Roe because I don't personally believe Roe went far enough. I think we need language like we have in the abortion access amendment. That should be kind of the national standard. And this is critically important because, you know, you hear from women in California, women in New York, and they're like, I'm so grateful that I live in a state where, you know, I have, I have great access to reproductive health care. The thing that gets lost there is that if Trump wins the White House, the Republicans take the Senate and keep the House, they are absolutely going to try to put in a national abortion ban. David Schweikert has co-sponsored one six times. And so people who are, you know, feeling good in their in their deep blue states that they have great access to abortion care, that is on the line in November. So that's what we need to be messaging on to voters across the country. The rights and freedoms you think they you have are under attack and we have to protect them federally. Kurt. So look, there there's a uh there's a, a piece of legislation called the Women's Health Protection Act. And uh, we need to get that passed because what does that do? It, it codifies a nationwide right to an abortion. It protects abortion providers to provide those services. Uh, it provides the ability to get over-the-counter uh, contraceptives and so on and so on. These are the things. This, this is a human right, a fundamental human right. If you don't control your body, you literally are enslaved. You are enslaved. And, and the fact that some guy is trying to decide the most difficult decision a woman could have in her life is beyond outrageous. And as uh, Connor said, Mr. Schweikert has voted time and time again to uh, eradicate the rights of women. And so this is a winning, it's a winning issue for us, and it's the right side. It's the right side for humanity. Andre. Yeah, I absolutely agree with what uh, Connor and Kurt uh, both said. Uh, this is about human rights, uh, and it is about the understanding that we as a nation a long time ago settled that we don't make human rights consist, cons uh, contingent on a state-by-state -state, uh, assessment. Uh, human rights apply to all wherever you live, uh, and it's true. What David Schweikert is trying to do is to take the 1864 ban uh, that we saw in Arizona and make that national, uh, a no-exceptions national ban on abortion and they'll succeed if they uh, gain power. It's beyond that though. It's also the understanding that this is about people's own bodies and uh, abortion is just one piece that's on the chopping block. Uh, this has been a 50 year struggle. When I worked for uh, Al Gore and I was asked to write the Democratic Party platform, this is what we were fighting when Barack Obama asked me to write change we can believe in. This is what we are fighting. It's what we are fighting today. Contraceptive rights, IVF rights, uh, gay, ma uh, gay marriage, all across the board, they are coming for our rights and we have to beat them. Thank you all for your responses to these 10 questions. You will now have the opportunity to give 90 second closing statements. We'll start with Kurt, followed by Andre and Connor. Kurt. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the JDCA for allowing us this opportunity. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's it's a well-worn kind of concept, but this is the most important election in the history of this country. We are facing attacks upon our democracy, upon our freedoms, upon economic vitality, and this this is this is serious. I mean, when I'm at the door, I'm telling folks our democracy is in danger and in peril. And again, I've seen how democracy dies. They are following the autocratic playbook, chapter by chapter by chapter. And so I believe through my experiences and my qualifications that I can beat David Schweikert. You know, we should be thinking about not necessarily who can David Schweikert beat, but who can not, I'm sorry, not only who can beat Schweikert, but who can Schweikert beat? And what is he going to do? What ad can he run against me? What, that I work to help stop human trafficking, that I work for Congress for 10 years, that I worked along the border to help uh, people? I mean, there is no negative attack ad that he can put against me. There is none. And I can beat this guy. I know I can beat this guy. And this is obviously one of the five, six most important races in the country. We've got to flip the house. All these pieces of legislation that I've talked about, it only happens if we take back the House, we keep the White House, and we keep the Senate. That's what we're going to do. Andre. 
Well, I, I also want to thank JDCA for hosting this and for uh, everything that uh, this organization does that, that's so important. I actually also want to thank uh, Connor and Kurt for showing up. Uh, uh, look, uh, JDCA is not uh, just for Jewish Democrats. It is for the values of the Jewish people in the Democratic Party. And uh, and so I really appreciate them being here uh, because the values of Tikkun Olam that drive myself and so many of us are the values of the Democratic Party, whether you're Jewish or not. Um, Kurt's absolutely right. This is the most important election we have to win here. I'm proud of the kind of campaign we've put together. Uh, our campaign has raised, uh, outraised David Schweikert every single quarter. I'm the only challenger in America to do that uh, against an incumbent. We've set a record for anybody running for Congress in Arizona, done that without taking a penny from corporate PACs, done that without any self-funding, just from the support of, of people. I'm proud of the support of Jewish mayor in the Phoenix, uh, Kate Gallego, and uh, Steve Gallardo, the only Democrat on the county board of supervisors, and and all kinds of elected officials are our Jewish mayor in Paradise Valley, and uh, the mayor of uh, Fountain Hills, and 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 many others. And my background as somebody who served in the military, enlisted in the Navy after 9/11, somebody who uh, served as an Arizona prosecutor, is going to allow me to go toe to toe in a district that is absolutely winnable, where we saw people like Mark Kelly and others win this race by seven, eight uh, percent. We can beat David Schweikert and we will. And I'm so honored that all of you gave us your time today. Connor. So I agree completely with Andre that showing up matters and that includes all of you. So I'm, I'm very thankful for JDCA putting this on today and, and 60 of you who joined to hear about you know us and, and these very important issues. There are a couple of candidates in this race who pretty consistently don't show up. And I think it's fair to ask the question, if people aren't showing up now, are they going to show up for you when they get to Washington? This race is all about one thing, and that is beating David Schweikert. That is it. That is the only mission. And I am fully committed to doing that. I will support whoever emerges from this primary. Again, everybody on this call will support whoever emerges from the primary. Some candidates have not committed to doing so. I'm from this district. I grew up here. I'm a product of the public school system K through 12. My wife and I are raising our three beautiful boys here in the same public school system. And they're also zoned to attend Chaparral High School, just like I did. I've always been a Democrat. I've long held progressive values. And I can flip this seat without sacrificing those principles and values. Perhaps most importantly, I have the team and the resources to actually win. So my entire campaign team is the same team that got Adrian Fontes elected Secretary of State in 2022 by the widest margin of any candidate statewide. We took that already great mousetrap, we bolted onto it and made it even better. I'm also the only candidate in this race with more cash on hand than David Schweikert. I've raised money in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. We are built to go the distance, raise what we need, raise the awareness that we need, and we're going to take out David Schweikert this November. Thank you all so much. Thank you to all three of our candidates for being with us today and to all of you for joining us for this forum. While we touched on some of the issues of importance to Jewish voters, we didn't get to everything. And we encourage everyone to learn more about the candidates' positions by visiting their website and to visit jewishdems.org to learn more about our efforts to mobilize millions of Jewish voters in advance of the November election. I'd now like to turn to JDCA board member and political chair Izzy Klein to close out the forum. Izzy. Hey, Ali, th thanks so much. And um, I'm Izzy Klein. Now, I want to thank the candidates, uh, Andre, Connor, and Kurt. Um, really appreciate all of you joining us today. Forums like this one are crucial for voters as we make important decisions about who's going who's gonna to represent us on the ballot. Um, in November. And we hope that you all learn more about the candidates and are inspired to take action over the coming months as the election rapidly approaches. We encourage you to join us for our upcoming phone banks, including our ballot drop-off phone bank in Arizona on July 2nd from 5.30 to 7.30 Mountain. Please click on the link in the chat uh, to register for that. As a reminder, the Arizona primary is on July 30th, and you can vote early until July 26th. And of course, the general election is on November 5th. And by the way, the presidential debate, the first one is tonight. So <laughs> FYI, I'm sure it's on your calendar. Um, we encourage you all to make your plan to vote uh, and support Democrats in this election. Um, and we hope that you will join JDCA's efforts to reelect the president, to hold the Senate, and to flip the House 
in November, starting with Arizona One. Um, thanks for supporting our work to elect Democrats who share our values and have a great rest of your day.